I guess uh, while we're getting my slides up, the only disclosure I have is uh, even though I'm going to be talking about ATP, my algorithm actually usually starts with TransOS, but I'm happy to talk about both. But the, uh, the solution to Dr. Pimenta's comment in which only God can save you when you manipulate the plexus, well, the solution is go in front of it. Let's see. All right. So uh, my disclosures have not changed in the last four hours. Um, so I'm going to talk about lateral ALIF, and then I'll talk about ATP or anterior to the psoas. Um, but in order to, you know, convince you guys that lateral ALIF makes sense, I need to talk to you a bit about, you know, why single position surgery. And so I'll briefly start there. Then we'll go over lateral ALIF. We'll talk about the advantages compared to supine ALIF. We'll talk about the technique, and we'll talk about the indications and contraindications. Um, and then we'll finish the back one third with um, anterior to the psoas in, in same format. And if we have time, I'll go over a case example. But I'm sensitive to the fact that we're running a little bit behind. Um, so single position surgery, you know, single position surgery, we traditionally think of it as either laterals or, you know, anterior the psoas or OLIF, whatever you want to call it. But you can also do ALIFs with single position surgery, and I'll show you how. Uh, the advantage of single position surgery, this is a pretty famous study now by Buckland out of um, Australia and his colleagues at NYU, and they, you know, I think these numbers are a little bit ridiculous. Um, three hour difference on a flip, I don't know about that. But I think we can all say that single position surgery is faster. Uh, three hours, I mean, I think NYU has some problems. Um, but certainly the flip allows you to you know, save time and positioning. You know, um, Amir showed us how to put in screws in the lateral position. Um, certainly it saves you on operative cost, you know, less disposables, less OR time, et cetera. Um, and I do believe the ileus um, variable because there's less tension and less manipulation on the peritoneum in the lateral position. Um, so I think it's fair to say it's faster. This much faster, I don't know, but this is a pretty famous study these days. Um, like I said, or like Amir showed us, we can put in screws in the lateral position. It's uh, pretty ergonomic, especially when you're using the robot. Um, and so we can save quite a bit of time in, in avoiding the flip. Um, whether you're doing a lateral ALIF or even a OLIF or a, even a trans-psoas lateral, doesn't matter, the peritoneum does fall away. And so your corridor to access 5-1 um, anteriorly or anything above 4-5 uh, from a lateral or anterior to the psoas approach is easier because that peritoneum, as long as there's not a history of previous retroperitoneal surgery or radiation, uh, will float away. And so your corridor is facilitated in the lateral position. Um, my vascular colleagues will tell me that ergonomics at the 5-1 level are more easy in the lateral position compared to traditional supine, and so that's one of the variables they always point out. I'll tell you the biggest reason that I would be an advocate, and I am an advocate for lateral 5-1 ALIF, um, is the ability to do an ALIF at 5-1 as opposed to in the prone position, well, you basically have to do a T-LIF. And in my hands, um, a T-LIF at 5-1 is at best neutral, uh, meaning if I had 10 degrees of lordo there, I'm probably staying at 10 degrees versus an ALIF I can very reliably reconstruct 5-1 and, and often 4-5, which as we know, that's about 80% of what we treat. And like Dr. Skaggs mentioned earlier, we want that level around 36 degrees, otherwise you're predisposed your patients um, to worse PROs and certainly adjacent segment changes. Uh, so specifically, lateral ALIF. The indications for lateral ALIF are honestly the same as supine ALIF. Um, like I said, the advantages of lateral ALIF are ergonomics, uh, facilitated peritoneal mobilization, um, and doing basically access from L1 to S1 all in the same position. And so the ideal indication is low BMI. You know, it's easier to work with low BMI patients at 5.1. You certainly don't want to do a challenging case in the lateral position at 5.1 for your first time. So you want, you know, no previous retroperitoneal surgery, no history of radiation. Uh, you want to check your vascular anatomy. We'll go over some examples. But you want a nice wide bifurcation um, between the uh, veins at 5.1. And you certainly want to be cognizant of any anterior osteophytes, particularly coming off of the lateral border of 5-1 because what happens is those osteophytes dig into the veins and when you try to mobilize those veins, particularly in an older patient, uh, you can get a back wall tear. And it's not a big deal. You can control it. But in the lateral position, that can be very challenging. So these are patients perhaps you want to do in the supine position where there's a higher risk of complication. Uh, relative contraindications for lateral ALIF, these, once again, these are cases you probably want to do in the supine position, uh, morbid obesity, high grade 1, 2 spondies, and steep sacral slope. This was a patient of mine um, where you can see that sacral slope is quite aggressive. That's not one we want to do in the lateral position. We did that supine. Like I said, this is just an example of some anterior osteophytes. Be wary of these. If you see them, not a contraindication to ALIF in the lateral position, but just be wary. Maybe if you're worried, do it in the supine position. 
Like I said, you wanna look at the vascular bifurcation when you're choosing your first couple cases to do in the lateral position if you're not familiar with the position. Uh, choose easy cases, wide bifurcation. Don't fight the bifurcation. If you need to work between the bifurcation, dissect the iliolumbar vein, better to do it in the supine position. Um, I always look at vein mobility. Like I said, I want to choose easy cases for lateral 5-1 ALIF. Um, so what I look for is fat behind the veins. I think of that as analogous to air in the disc space when I'm looking at to see if a disc is going to pop open or mobilize. So when I see fat behind veins, that's a good day. I know those veins are probably going to mobilize pretty easy. Um, so like I said, Lateral ALIF, what is the advantage compared to supine ALIF? Number one, um, less ileus. I think that's pretty fair to say because that retroperitoneal space is, is more open. It's more mobile in the lateral position versus supine. So you're not tugging on the peritoneum and basically going all the way across midline. Um, you're just having to mobilize it from the lateral border. Um, Avoiding the midline incision, my vascular colleagues will tell me that the sort of oblique incision, which I'll show you, has a bit more of a cosmetic healing pattern, certainly less ventral hernia, uh, potentially more ergonomic. To me, the biggest advantage, like I said, is my vascular surgeon can be doing access to 5.1 and I can be doing simultaneous access from L1 to L5. And so we can work at the same time um, and potentially minimize operative time and improve patient outcomes. In terms of the technique, the positioning for lateral ALIF is pretty similar to whether you're doing OLIF or traditional lateral. The biggest thing you have to be cognizant about is don't flex the hips too much because that's going to block your axis, particularly if you have to drop your hand to get into that disc space. Another thing that I'll um, just point out is right here, when you're doing your actual trialing and implant, some technique guides will, you know, they'll have a picture of like someone putting some support on the on the patient's uh, posterior torso. Um, I like to put this hip grip right on the PSIS because that allows you to really impact without displacing the patient. In terms of positioning, like I said, you want to get perfect images, get a perfect AP, get a perfect lateral, very similar to your traditional lateral approach. In terms of the incision, it's basically halfway between the iliac crest and the lateral border of the rectus sheath. Um, this is just a video that I edited, um, taken off um, the Globus website, but basically this is the incision. You know, through skin, you're going to go through your three traditional abdominal layers, external abdominal, internal abdominal, transversalis abdominis, and then you'll see that sort of yellow hue showing you the retroperitoneal space. So when you see that, you know you're in the right corridor. And a lot of it is blunt dissection. Basically, you come down just like Dr. Pimenta showed us. You feel the anterior border of the psoas, and you wrap all the way around, and you mobilize that peritoneal contents. Um, and that's all just very blunt dissection. And most commonly, the, vein's gonna, the artery is going to be sitting right in front of the vein, and you'll feel a very strong pulsatile structure. Once you get down, that's your view. And, and from there, you guys all know how to do an ALIF. Um, so it's a pretty simple technique as if you really cherry pick your patients. So anterior to the psoas. It's, you know, when I was a resident, I remember hearing all these different lifts, O lift, D lift, X lift, uh, ATP, T lift, PLIF, and I was, you know, fairly confused as a junior resident. So some of us will hear, you'll hear us call it ATP, anterior to the psoas. Sometimes you'll hear it called pre psoas. Sometimes you hear it called O lift. Um, they're all kind of, in general, referring to the same thing. They're referring to going in front of the psoas, developing the plane between the vessels and the anterior board of the psoas, and avoiding the lumbar plexus. Um, so the biggest advantage when you hear us talk about anterior to the psoas, we're usually comparing it to trans or traditional lateral. And so what's the advantage? Like Rod told us, the lumbar plexus is incredibly unpredictable. We really don't understand it. And like you said, every patient's anatomy is highly variable. Um, and so the advantage of going in front of the psoas is you don't have to really worry about the plexus. You get in front of the genital femoral nerve, you push the plexus posteriorly, uh, or sorry, you push the psoas posteriorly, but it takes the plexus with you, and you, you utilize that window between the vein, the vein and the, um, the psoas, which contains the lumbar plexus. So um, huge advantage in terms of safety and minimizing the risk of neurologic injury, and these patients don't really wake up with that anterior um, hip flexion pain or psoas pain. The other advantage of anterior to the psoas is you don't have to worry about the crest, right? One of the things I look at when I'm seeing if a patient's a candidate for traditional lateral is I look at the crest. But the crest is really not an issue with OLIF at 4, 5, or above um, because you can work in front of it. Uh, the other advantage is because you're working oblique, you can actually do a contralateral uh, direct decompression. Sometimes there are some osteophytes coming off of the inferior border of, say, L4, 5 end plate, and so you can, you can get those out with the kerosene. Uh, the biggest disadvantage, the critique or, you know, Proponents of traditional lateral will say, oh, I don't like anterior the psoas because you are working oblique, and so that can be that can throw you off a bit. Um, they can certainly be at increased risk for contralateral root injury, and if you don't appropriately mobilize and develop the window, like Rod said earlier, the biggest risk of anterior to the psoas is vascular injury, not neurologic injury. 
Contraindications to anterior to the psoas, certainly you want to look out for transitional anatomy. Sometimes that psoas is really pulled forward, and so the window between the vessels and the psoas is not there. That's maybe a patient you want to consider a T-lift or an A-lift on. Watch out for lateralized vessels, like I show here in this example. That's not a great O-lift candidate. A high bifurcation, the reason that matters is because um, that's probably a transitional anatomy patient, and maybe you're better off with an A-lift or a T-lift. And low BMI, it's not a contraindication, but generally when we do spine surgery and we see a skinny patient, we think low BMI, great. Uh, however, with any retroperitoneal surgery, particularly a lift, excuse me, particularly anterior to the psoas or traditional lateral, uh, low BMI actually worries me a bit. And those are patients where I want to take, do a two incision technique or do what Dr. Pimenta said, where he rolls, he basically does a two incision technique, but with one incision and really develop that retroperitoneal space. Because when patients are skinny, um, there's not a lot of retroperitoneal fat. So you really need to make sure you're safely mobilizing the peritoneal contents anteriorly. In terms of the you know technique or positioning for anterior to the psoas, like I said, pretty similar to lateral. We generally don't flex the hips as much, but there's not a stark difference. Um, the incision varies based on what you're trying to do and obviously where the crest is, but it's generally you make your incision in line with the disc space. If you're working at 4.5 and the crest is high, you make sure you're in front of the crest. Uh, and like I said, the exposure, the layers are all the same. You get down to the transversalis fascia, look for that yellow hue of the retroperitoneal space and pop in safely. Uh, this is a video I want to give credit to Double ANS, where I took this video from. I edited it. I sped it up a bit. Um, but this is just a video showing you guys the technique pretty nicely. Uh, a bit of an aggressive incision, more of a, a mirror incision from earlier. But uh, external abdominals, internal abdominals. Uh, you'll see the transversalis abdominals right there. And you can see the thin transversalis fascia. And you can see that yellow hue right behind it. And that's retroperitoneal space. And you bluntly get into that safe window. And when you're doing an anterior to the psoas approach, you're, you're actually in front of the patient as opposed to traditional lateral where you're behind the patient. That's pulling all the peritoneal contents downwards. And that's actually the psoas right there. And so then you, the psoas is now on the top side of the screen and we're basically pulling the psoas um, towards the patient's back and you're developing that safe plane between the vessels and the psoas and you'll see basically uh, the ALL coming into the image in a couple seconds, right there. So that's just that's the anterolateral aspect of the disc space. And so once you're down, you typically shim. Um, I do. I use monitoring. I know one of the biggest advantages of not doing a traditional lateral is not using monitoring. But I do use monitoring. And the reason I do is because I actually really like to pull the psoas back at this point with the genital femoral nerve. And so I just want to make sure I'm not putting too much tension on the lumbar plexus because I prefer, if I can, to work parallel as opposed to uh, oblique. Um, so we're gonna, you guys are going to see a lot of this throughout the labs uh, the rest of today and tomorrow, um, but I just wanted to highlight to you guys some of the sort of key points, indications, advantages, and contraindications to lateral ALIF and um, ATP. We're good on, just do a quick case example. It's literally two slides. Um, this is a 60-year-old female, and the reason I want to highlight this is because um, it shows the, the um, uniqueness of being able to do su uh, lateral ALIF and ATP. 60-year-old female, claudicatory back pain. She's got four, five, three, four spondy. Um, the first thing I look at, like I said, my algorithm, full disclosure, is I usually want to do a traditional lateral. Um, crest, not terribly unfavorable for four, five, certainly favorable for three, four. Um, but if you go through her MRI, three, four, you know, central lateral recess stenosis, spondy, psoas looks favorable. Four, five, even though crest favorable, psoas very unfavorable, right? Anteriorly migrated, uh, probably not a great case to go through the psoas. Similarly, if you look at the vascular anatomy here, high bifurcation, right? If we're calling this traditional numbering, this is four or five. Bifurcation's right there. So probably not a great case for, you know, anterior to the psoas either, right? Look at that window between the psoas and the vessels. But probably a great case for ALIF. Even though we're calling this four or five, the vascular anatomy is begging us to come between the bifurcation instead of around it. And so I actually indicated this patient for single position, four or five lateral ALIF, and three, four, traditional lateral. However, when we got into the OR, and you can see this even on the pre-op imaging, if you watch her lumbar plexus, and you can see this on a, a nice MRI, you can watch, see her lumbar plexus. It's basically the femoral nerve is right at the 50 yard line. And her disc measured about 26 millimeters, so that means I have 13 millimeters of working window. Uh, most grafts are at minimum 18, most some are 22, and so that's a very narrow window to get into. I got down, I tried to do a traditional lateral. I monitor, um, EMG stim fine, everything's green. What did Rod say? If everything's green, this is, even though this is 3 4, this is really 4 5 anatomy, something's wrong. Ran motors, right sided vastus down. 
Vastus, not the most reliable for motors, but I believed it. I'm on the right side. Take the retractors out. Motors are back. So that tells me I'm irritating the femoral nerve. Tried to come even more anterior, pull back, same thing happened. So what did I do? I converted to OLIF. I converted to anterior to the psoas. I extended the incision a bit, came all the way in front of the psoas, and then came back and worked my way um, in front of the genital femoral nerves. And so, you know, she ended up with this. She's doing pretty good. Uh, two week follow up, great, right? Um, and so, my point with that final case is some of us think of ourselves as trans psoas lateral surgeons. Some of us think of ourselves as anterior to the psoas. I would encourage you guys to learn all the techniques because that way you're not really pigeonholing yourself into one particular problem. Because I'll tell you five years ago, that three, four level, I may have aborted and just done a T lift. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Rand. That was, that was insightful. That was a great talk. Any questions for Dr. Aluri? Okay, how are we doing in the lab? Is the is uh, are we ready for the uh, the uh, prone transoas lab demonstration? Okay. So uh, so so you said your go to is still the transoas. Why why is that? That's a good question. Uh, to be honest, I just like working parallel as opposed to orthogonal. Um, and the system that I've trained on as a trainee was more traditional trans -OS. But like I said, I think most companies these days have all the offerings. Um, but it's just it's purely the preference to work parallel. And your cage preference? As, oh, yeah, so uh, I have a whole talk on this. But I, I vary based on patient anatomy. Um, so certainly we know. Peak is hydrophobic. It's a non-union generator. Second, third generation peak has some sort of surface coating, you know, porosity, um, hydroxyapatite. Um, so for poor bone mineral density, I have a CT scan on most patients. So if they have poor hound's food units, I tend to go with peak uh, just for modulus matching. Um, but if they have very good bone, I tend to go with 3D printed titanium. Okay, so uh, we're going to air into the lab now. We're going to be doing a, a prone trans with uh, Dr. Abdul-Jabbar.